Thanks very much and thanks everyone for joining. Um, I'd like to welcome you to NASDAQ's Insider Trading webcast. Um, with, uh, during the last few years, regulators around the world have shown their willingness to investigate and prosecute insider trading cases and levy severe fines and penalties. Buy side firms involved have suffered significant damage to their reputation, potentially resulting in lost assets under management, amounting to even more than the fines and penalties themselves and in some cases a catastrophic loss of business. Based on NASDAQ's latest white paper on insider trading, today's webcast will cover um, approaches to insider trading and controlling risks, regional differences um, within insider trading, um, regulations and the buy-side compliance culture, how you go about detecting insider trading in buy-side firms, and the partnership between NASDAQ and buy-side behavioral analytics specialist cybernetics. So uh, we'll kick it off. We have um, a disclaimer um, and we also for today's presentation it's being recorded and we will send a notice to participants when it is made available. The presentation will run about 45 minutes. All attendees are in listen-only mode. We will be taking questions at the end of the presentation however please submit questions at any time. We're accepting questions both through the chat function and through email at markettech at nasdaq.com. To submit a question through chat, utilize that ask a question button that appears there in the upper right corner of your screen. All questions will be automatically sent to the hosts and presenters. So before we get into it, I would like to briefly introduce today's present presenters. Uh, it's my pleasure to introduce Danielle Tierney. Danielle is a senior analyst at IT Group, specializing in market structure and trade surveillance. Her focus areas include equity and derivatives, market structure, exchanges, electronic trading, and macroeconomic and regulatory drivers. She also covers buy-side equity research, buy-side macro trends, hedge fund and asset management, ETFs, and mutual funds, research portals, and market data. We also have Paul Young joining us who is a new member of the NASDAQ team from our recent acquisition of BuySide Behavioral Analytics Specialist Cybernetics. Paul is the head of BuySide Product Development for Risk and Surveillance Solutions at NASDAQ. With over 20 years of experience working in financial technology, Paul holds a PhD in cosmology from Durham University and has led research and development teams within data science focused fintech startups. Thanks for joining us, Danielle and Paul. My name is Michael O'Brien and besides being the MC, I'm also the Head of Product Management for Risk and Surveillance Solutions at NASDAQ. In my role at NASDAQ, I have the pleasure of working with our global client base to oversee risk management, compliance, trading and surveillance technology for brokers, exchanges, buy-side firms and listed corporations. So with introductions complete, we will move into today's agenda, what we want to cover off. So first of all, we want to look at insider trading. Um, what is it? And specifically, how does it apply to the buy side? Um, some regional differences uh, around insider trading regulations and how to uh, handle those differences. Um, buy side compliance culture. You know, how is how are we viewing and what are we seeing in terms of how a compliance culture is evolving on the buy side? Then down to the business of how do you detect insider trading and then finishing off with a look at a holistic approach to monitoring that's evolving which is looking across multiple uh, data channels. So um, let's start with insider trading. I think everyone has you know a reasonable understanding of, of what um, of what insider trading is, uh, is of the various forms of market abuse. It's probably the most widely understood and widely publicized. Um, I think it's certainly something that we've seen the scope of what you need to monitor for insider trading has increased significantly over recent years, particularly one with the asset classes across which you need to be looking for potentially insider trading. Um, but also with things like Ma last year bringing in the notion of intention so that you know, now you need to be looking not only for insider trading where it's executed either successfully or otherwise but also look at where someone may even just have an intention 
to insider trade. So how you know how do you how do you mine for that type of activity where you're looking for an intention? So certainly the scope of um, insider trading has increased, and I think we've certainly seen an increase in the number of successful prosecutions. And um, I guess the trend has been criminal prosecutions. I think over um, recent years, the FCA in the UK alone has launched 32 successful criminal um, convictions or prosecutions. Prior to 2008, it had um, commenced or uh, completed zero um, in terms of criminal um, litigation for insider trading. So we've gone from zero prior to 2008, and then since then, we've had 32 successful ones. So there's um, a real focus from the regulator. Um, and through both ourselves and, and bringing on board cybernetics into NASDAQ now as NASDAQ's buy side compliance solution, uh, we're particularly keenly aware of how crucial insider trading is to the buy side and that it's not only the risk of fines, but you know, reputational risk is substantial. And Paul, given your experience, you know, across the buy side, like I'm sure you've you know you've observed that and how it can impact and how important it is. Absolutely, absolutely, it's it's number one factor in the clients' officers' minds and the portfolio managers as well. They're very very aware of this. Um, I think over the re recent decades, there's been more and more emphasis on uh, reputation and conduct in when people do due diligence. So um, particularly if you've got um, institutional investors. Um, so, for an, obviously, for an asset manager, asset center management is the main thing, and and for them, institutional investors are a big chunk. These are big ticket mandates, and they, when they uh, onboard someone like that, questions they're going to ask when they do the due diligence process is, have you had any investigations? What 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 processes and procedures you've got in place? Uh, and these will affect their allocation decisions, and and this will very much make or break the fund. And if they have an investigation, even a hint of investigation. Later on, people are asking when um, have you been investigated, and if so, then the red flag, and again, it gets harder to raise new capital. So, this major, major impact on business. Sure, and I think, and you, you can see on the screen there a couple of you know recent, fairly you know quite highly publicised uh, recent prosecutions um, of buy side firms and of principals at those buy side firms that have been fairly well publicised. So we don't need to. I guess to go into the details of those, but I think uh, Danielle, on your side, um, you've recently, you know, Nasdaq and ITA have worked uh, together closely over the last three years in in completing an annual um, compliance survey, and you, you particularly focus on the buy side and what we uh, what you've seen there at measuring trends across the buy side, and I think you've seen some interesting. Um, analytics and you know, you know, information coming through that around you know the importance of this to the buy side. Absolutely, thank you, Michael. So just to back up for a minute to to really emphasize how important prevention of insider trading is, especially for the buy side. Um, we need to also look at how important reputational risk is in terms of looking at the key goals of the compliance function. Um, we, we've conducted the survey three years in a row now, as, as Michael mentioned, and it's actually the largest collection of, of first-hand uh, primary compliance data uh, in the industry currently. And each year we've seen how, how the emphasis on reputational risk as opposed to avoiding regulatory fines as the key function of compliance. Also, interestingly, consequential fines for the buy side do have to be are considered to be at least one million to to make a difference, but, rep, but protection of reputational risk is is still far more important as the as the goal of the compliance function. Um, insider trading was clearly a top threat to reputational risk. Even an inquiry, um, e even if it's not an actual an actual conflict, but an inquiry that's publicized can cause lasting damage to a firm's reputation. And sure. actually, if we can go I mean, to the next slide, sorry. Yeah. Yeah. No, it's quite pronounced there. Um, 
the just in the space of one year, uh, the importance there around reputational risk. But yeah, as you were saying, you've also got some interesting data there around insider trading and market manipulation. Absolutely, insider trading and market manipulation are definitely two of the two of the top concerns. Uh, market manipulation, of course, being a key goal of trade surveillance, but insider trading is just as important. So really, they're tied for the number one trade monitoring goal. Um, regulatory con consequences for both can be in incredibly severe. And again, not, not even um, a, a proven regulatory case, but just an inquiry, just the, just the suggestion of potential insider trading or market manipulation activity, which are obviously close, closely related, can be enough to damage a firm's reputation, sometimes to even the point of, of destroying the firm itself. Um, highly publicized infractions are much, much harder to recover from. And it, we've seen, you know, we've seen obvious examples of recently publicized infractions, SAC as they mentioned, and JP Morgan, HSBC. Um, it's, it's just, it can be very devastating to, to a firm's business operations. And we see this clearly in, in the survey in the terms of importance. It's um, both insider trading and market manip manipulation are far more important um, to firms than just dealing with the regulatory fine itself. Sure. Um, so then we, you know, if we look at the insider trading, um, the differences in how the law um, has been applied, say, between the United States and, and in Europe, we do see um, an interesting um, distinction, I think, in how that law is applied and, and where, where it applied, applies. Um, in the United States, if there's a particular uh, focus on the on the, the requirement that there be a breach of duty, yeah, which you know particularly strikes at exactly you know um, the the heart of what uh, buy side firms do in terms of the the, the duty that they owe. Um, so it is you know still trading on the basis of material non-public information, but there is that additional element that there must be a fiduciary duty. Uh, which is potentially breached uh, to the investors with, with which the trade occurs. The European Union's approach, um, I think you could say, is broader in that it doesn't. It looks um, primarily at the you know the act of possessing insider information, um, and that um, that information being not generally available and, and and price sensitive, and then dealing on that particular information. Uh, so it's based on the on the parity of the information and the availability of that information, rather than the uh, fiduciary duty around that. So it is a um, you know a significant distinction with you know between how the laws are applied. Um, so Paul, you know, in terms of what you've seen and how you would advise you know customs and so on, on in terms of what um, you know what definition or understanding of insider trading to take, you know, what, what's your experience? Um, my experience is very much that when compliance officers look at the, the various jurisdictions, they will look to select the most conservative and the, the most um, difficult to meet requirements in each of the categories. Most of the most major asset managers are global anyway, and they'll, they'll be regulated in, in multiple regions, but they will always want to um, have, have beyond doubt in terms of their, both their processes and the software solutions they use, so I think they will, you know, they will pick both sides. And for example, on, on the left there, in the, US, on the states, is the concept of material. So very much that we want to demonstrate that it, that this information was material in terms of its impact on the market, for example. And then on the right hand side, in terms of understanding the um, the possession of of, of, of the um, the material, they will look for people to have systems in place where they can trace back and audit. Where where contacts points were, who was in possession of material at different times. So it's it's, it's a very much a combination. Sure, and I think Danielle, in the context of the survey, you've um, you looked at you know which particular regulations are, are having the largest impact and you know taking up most people's time and and you know concern. Um, what have you found there? Well, we've seen a really interesting shift in the in the rating of 
which regulations are currently the most challenging for firms. When we, the first year we conducted this survey in, in 2015, Dodd-Frank actually still uh, ranked highest in, term, in terms of key concerns, followed by MIFID II and market abuse regulation. At the time, remember, MIFID II was, was still quite a few, few years away in implementation. So firms were at, at, sort of, at sort of a transition point between really finishing their strategy for Dodd-Frank compliance and, and the U.S. regulations and shifting to dealing with the, the new regulations mandated by MIFID II. Um, in the la however, over the last two years, we've seen uh, both MIFID II and, and MAR increasingly ranking uh, much higher importance than, than Dodd-Frank. So it's really been a very clear shift in the rankings of, of which regulations are the most concerned. And if you if you do look at the at the chart, it's a bit small, but if you're able to see it there on the right hand side, you'll see that in our most recent version of the survey, MIFID II just really blows away the percentages of, of key concerns as compared to the other regulations. And of course, you know, the obvious uh, explanation is that we have implementation just uh, marching down the pipeline in January 2018 which is now two months away. At the time of, this, of conducting the survey, it was still over six months away. Um, but you see you know, the, the levels of concern there are over two-thirds of firms. Um, so what that tells us is that you know, obviously the regulations are, are intense and very intricate, and firms are putting a lot of attention into developing their compliance strategy, but also especially um, their technology strategy for compliance. Additionally, um, this, this survey, it's worth mentioning, sampled global firms, um, a, a relatively representative sample from across the globe. But the global nature of trading and the global nature of compliance puts uh, both EU and US regulations in the, in the crosshairs of, of the compliance goals of, of many firms. So firms are, are certainly not limited to just their national jurisdiction regulations as, as many firms even, you know, even down to the high tier three firms conduct global trading operations. Sure, and I, and I think we, we see the impact of these regulations over the years uh, reflected in, you know, how um, compliance is set up and, um, and, and the perception of compliance within within the firms. I, I know in my time in the industry and with smarts, you know, initially on the sell side, you could see there's a change in compliance culture going from something that was, say, 15, 20 years ago was, you know, the people in the corner who, for the most part, were largely ignored to now where they're, you know, a key part of the business. And I think we're seeing, well, we, we certainly are seeing that same change um, on the buy side over, over the last um, you know, five to ten years. Um, and so again, these are just some broad questions that you can see there around, you know, around how you would frame compliance culture within a buy side firm. You know, is it regarded as a partner of the business or is it seen as the police comes along and knocks you on the head when you do something wrong or is it you know, simply the people you keep in the dark? Um, are they included in key business decisions? Do they report into senior management? Um, you know, who carries out the compliance function? You know, are they specialists? Are they people that understand how investment decisions are made? Is it a dedicated role or a multi-function role? Um, I think, Paul, you know, you've had ex extensive experience on the buy side. Like, how have you seen the buy side culture, the well, com compliance culture evolve? I, I would agree. And uh, most of my career in 20 years has been as a portfolio manager, and I have definitely witnessed, both with my colleagues and other institutions and the ones I've worked for, um, that, that general progression from um, somebody who you would not talk to, you would not, you wouldn't know really sure who they were, and maybe only talk to them once or twice, and, you know, and then someone who you feared would a visit from. And, uh, and then now, someone who's a champion of the, of the, of the conduct of the company. They're actually tra actively training you and making you aware that 
the, the conduct of the company and the perception of the company is in your hands and where you, where you perform your business. So they, they're people that are heavily engaged in portfolio management. They understand the challenges of portfolio management, how difficult it is to be a portfolio manager. You know, you're expected to know everything about the particular securities or, uh, you know, that you're, you're an expert on and that everyone expects you to be able to answer immediately when something happens. You spend all your time submersed in that industry and talking to people and having regular contact. At the same time, you have to be very, very aware uh, that any moment you might be told something which is, is not is not public, and that all that training is coming from these these champions, these, the compliance officers are really engaged in the business. And that's that's a big shift. Yeah, so and just particularly around insider trading, like it's a, you know it's such a fine line because you know in terms of the buy side, you know, and portfolio managers, you know, the whole business is geared to having that edge, and and you know, and that's what they're specialists in, doing that research to get that understanding of companies and so on, where to invest, but it's that really fine line between having that edge and then maybe crossing over, Absolutely. Crossing over the other side. It's fiercely competitive yeah. and everyone is looking to have that edge and to, 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 you know, to see that the, the, the event coming before everyone else and to be on the right side of it. And yes, the, it's, it's, a tif it's a difficult uh, place to be. And, and that engagement from the compliance officers that really understand, they, may, they can be involved in the whole business process, the whole decision making, and be that, make the people self-conscious aware of, of the, the balance they must strike. Yeah. And I think that's, that's something that we've only seen in recent years, and that level of engagement. And I think, Danielle, um, <clears throat> certainly that's an area of focus too with the survey is around the strengthening of, of culture. So what have you observed there? Well, this is another really interesting takeaway from our global compliance survey. Um, we're really able to, to track the, the changes in the position of compliance within the firm. And as, as you mentioned, one thing that we're definitely seeing is a strengthening overall of the compliance department's influence and, and really uh, being taken more seriously by the other departments within the firm. Um, one, one, so one interesting point is that compliance departments are increasingly contributing to strategic, discuss strategic discussions within the firm. Um, more and more compliance officers report that they're being given a true voice, a true a seat at the table is actually how we phrase the question, but they, they really have more of an effective voice into strategic firm discussions and overall business decisions. Um, Compliance standards are increasingly being considered highly important. And one might ask, well, when were they not important? How could compliance standards um, be you know, not important versus important? And the difference is really how, the, how their peers within the firm um, can look at the, the culture of compliance. If you were to rewind, as, as many of us can, and go back 10 or 15 years within the industry, a lot of us can remember when compliance standards were pretty much a checklist item within the firm. Um, I, prior to, to this role at ITA Group, I actually worked for a very a large global asset manager. And, and even as seriously as this firm took compliance standards, um, it was it was certainly more of a checklist item, and and not as much of a, a serious part of business operations as it's considered today. Additionally, I'm hearing um, an anecdotal reports through our qualitative interviews for other studies that compliance officers are actually being asked to contribute to even prospect pitches, uh, especially for investment sub advisors. So they're, not only are they a, a very important part of firm operations and strategic discussions, but now they're, you know, they're obviously an important part of the firm's going concern. So they're often included right next to the portfolio manager um, when meeting with clients or prospects for buy-side firms. Additionally, the lines of coordination with, uh, with other firm departments are becoming much closer. Um, compliance has always had to coordinate with, with firm departments, particularly the front office and, and the legal department. Um, but now the, this, the type of coordination is much more uh, actually hor horizontal instead of vertical. So it's much more in, a, in an advisory capacity as opposed to 
simply being called into the principal's office as, as it might have felt before. Multiple lines of defense, of defense are usually still maintained within the firms, so oftentimes the front office does continue to carry out its own trade monitoring and surveillance operations, but they're really working much closer with compliance to achieve the goal and, and, and achieve the most efficient and effective results instead of, um, as it were in the past, working more in a siloed capacity. So really, we are seeing, again, the, the level of importance of compliance strengthen within the firm, as well as the closeness of coordination. Sure. Thanks, thanks Danielle. That's, yeah, some really interesting trends there. Um, so then, I think when we get to the, to the business of detecting um, insider trading for the buy side, um, so when NASDAQ acquired cybernetics, there were quite a number of things that appealed, but I think you know, two of the main things were, one, they were completely grounded in buy side, that's you know, where all the people came from, and that's, you know, that, that was their, their specialty and their focus, and the second was their approach in terms of using you know, behavioral science and behavioral analytics, because on the buy side, it's you know, the, the how investment decisions are made, um, and how you know PMs and so on invest and divest is key to to identifying particularly things like insider trading and other forms of market abuse. So, um, so cybernetics was brought on board. Um, so I think Paul, like you know, when when we look at detecting insider trading, there's a you know a number of things to uh, to look at. One is okay, what are the contact points? Where can information pass? And within the buy side firms, there's a number of areas where information does cross, um, come across, you know, potentially, um, you know, non-public information. Um, and then there's that, the whole question of how, uh, how do you identify where, a, you know, a portfolio manager, you know, may be trading in a way which is not, you know, um, is against their normal behavior. So, so how does cybernetics do it when it's, a, you know, looking at detecting insider trading? Yeah, so um, I'd say, Underpinning a lot of what we do is, is uh, and addressing the point you mentioned, is understanding the, the investment process. We, when we look at trading, we don't look at trades in isolation. We're not simply comparing a trade to a distribution of previous trades. What we understand is that that decision in the context of that portfolio manager's portfolio at that point in time. So it's, it's very important to understand the motivations and how they change depending on the life cycle, life cycle and investment. Um, if, you, if you've got a strong idea about a, a winning stock and you've got a lot of passion about it and you think it's an opportunity cost, you will enter a position quite aggressively um, and you may actually accept some market impact. That's quite normal portfolio managed behavior. Uh, likewise, there might be times when uh, you have asset flows and you, you've, you have to rebalance your portfolio. That will trigger a lot of trades which potentially are worked in a way that um, that's quite passively. However, once you've got that sort of um, background, once you've got that context, then you can start putting the, the abnormal traits, that ones that are out of the ordinary. So, you know, a, a sort of example might be that someone's become aware, aware of some non-public information, and they actually close their position earlier than they normally would. So for the particular portfolio manager, we will have built up a picture of their typical behavior. We know their trading style. We know how long they typically hold their position. And then suddenly this one exits quite quickly. Maybe exits in very large trade sizes and have more market impact. That doesn't quite fit the profile. That doesn't quite fit the pattern we see. Uh, and that then uh, drives a sort of quite lines of questioning from the portfolio manager, uh, from the compliance officer, sorry, to the portfolio manager about why they're doing something different. And of course, there could be a perfectly good reason, but the point is now the compliance officer is equipped with this, this framework, this knowledge about the investment process, and that drives the questioning. And I think. That, that really addresses a lot of those, that, that second point there about understanding when they're crossing the line. Because you know what normal behavior looks like for your, for your PMs in your organization. And I think that's another thing to point out. Asset managers have very different cultures depending on the strategies they operate. Mm. Uh, someone who might be more passive and long-term and strategic, they may have a lot less sensitivity to information about their individual stocks. They may be looking to track sectors, and, and uh, whereas someone else, for example, a long-short hedge fund, may want to have employ lots of experts on those particular names because they are going to enter into the portfolio in quite short holding holding periods. 
they they're going to have a lot more contact with with with, in, with um, companies. They, they'll probably have analysts visit, visiting their factories and trying to assess the stock levels. You know, they will have much more contact in various different places with these organisations. So again, that's something that compliance officer has to keep in mind about what's what's right for their business. So what we try to do in in the service, the software service we provide, is trying to capture as many of these factors as possible, and bring them together to help compliance officer investigate that. And, and so, because and we talked there about mapping behaviours, and so, so what is the process like? How do you understand how a investment decision is made, and you know, how is this behavioural science approach applied? Yeah, this this is very interesting. So this is something I think we, we're quite pioneers in, in this approach. And um, we have uh, a team of behavioural experts, and led by Wendy, and uh, we we will spend time and have spent time with quite a few portfolio managers and in different asset managers in different strategies, um, going through a, a process of interviewing them and basically building up models of their decision-making process. Now, we don't have to do this every time with every client because effectively portfolio management in, in those factors that affect decisions are very similar between institutions. Portfolio manager can move from institution to institution. So really what we're trying to do is capture all of the factors that might be involved. And then we, we fit that model, if you like, to behaviours with a particular client. Well, you do that using historic trading patterns. We will we will look at not just simply their transactions, but the, their whole portfolios in terms of the positions they have, the fl asset flows, and this understanding the structure between their portfolios. And again, that's another thing to keep in mind is some aspects of the trading portfolio management may do and be fairly automatic. They might be triggered by risk rebalancing or by um, parent and child relationships in portfolios. Those can generate false positives, and again, the more you understand about the, the business process, the more it's integrated, the more higher quality um, surveillance you'll be able to do. So, and so, if someone is sitting there and, and yeah, they want to, um, they've got some level of monitoring happening now, but they want to get a bit more systematic about it. Like, what would be the, you know, what what are the minimum or the core data points? And so on that they would need to, you know, source internally and and, and get to pr provide in order to do effective monitoring for insider trading. You can get a long way with some fairly basic data, things that you will always always have because you'll need to do them for things like performance reporting. Mm -hmm. And the question is really about your backend systems and how easy it is to export the data. We see it. We've seen a trend over recent years of more and more accessibility with these systems. Um, we know that uh, there's more requirements for systems to interoperate, and so typically they do have ex export functions where we can extract data from various ports and points in the process. Uh, and then it becomes a simple case of delivering them to us and we ingest them. So, so for example, um, we will load, as I mentioned, position data, uh, assets under management, and transactions from the client. What we also load um, and this is, these are optional elements, it's not every client loads, gives us all this data. We will look, look at, for example, um, communication events. So calendar entries, uh, email metadata, for example, or even maybe as sophisticated as e-comms metadata. And these become events which we could search for behavior around. Also, um, internal embargo lists or stop lists or restriction lists. So different companies have different names, but they're often, as part of their procedures, when an organization becomes aware of non-public data, they will immediately say, no more trading in this name until it becomes public. Or very, very restricted trading, maybe, for example, where, um, liquidation is allowed, trades are allowed. Mm -hmm. So what we're looking for here is, before that internal event, did someone in the organization who knew it was going to go on embargo, perhaps even the person that put it on the embargo, did they change the positions in their portfolio? So this is a completely private piece of data, only the client knows about it, highly sensitive. However, it allows us to look for behavior that it shows you that intent. So we talked about before about you know, the regulators looking more and more for the intent. So this could be a case where someone actually doesn't even, the, the, the eventual news wasn't material, but at the time they can see their behavior around that material and actually drive questions from science officers. It may be that they, it's about educating them, and explaining them how you know, they, they should be conscious of this behavior and it, how, how it looks. Sure. And, and so, um, and what, you know, like you know, if you're wanting to put in place, um, you know, uh, coverage of insider trading amongst other sort of risks as well, and let's, you know, now forget that you know there's other risks as well that very much so, that, yeah. that, um, that we cover off. But you know, what, what does a typical project look like? Is it days, weeks, months? What's um, it's 
again, it, it's, it's a little bit dependent on the on the data systems, but I would say a typical client, is we're normally in a matter of weeks. Yeah. But we can get the data from them and give them a system and they can start looking back over historic trading, where they can look at how they've investigated these cases before and compare with our system, start building up that understanding and, and a sort of quality assurance in the way our systems work, and get them comfortable before they start going to production. We're very keen on taking as long as possible that process to, to get that uh, level of assurance. So obviously once the compliance officer take, take goes live with the system, then they're responsible for the compliance, and we're only a tool to assist that, so they need to be completely comfortable in it. And audited the process of, of testing the software and getting, getting an understanding of it. So that's something very important for us. So. Sure. And I, I think there, uh, you, you mentioned too around the monitoring of e-coms. Um, I think, um, um, Danielle, that you know, what you've observed there with, um, um, in your survey is, let me just get the right slide up here. Um, yeah, um, the importance uh, of e-coms and the monitoring of uh, you know, monitoring of e-coms as, as being a really important part and how it feeds into particularly insider trading. Absolutely. Well, we, we've talked a lot about intent um, and the, the importance of intent, especially with MIFID II. Um, but it's you know it's a key part of the insider trading uh, equation, if you will. Anyway, and e ecom surveillance is absolutely key to covering um, not not only as as you went over in the previous slides the investment decision making process. Um, but also being able to really show the actual intent um, and and the basically showing your work in the investment decision making process. The difference between um, the the difference between being able to show the use of the mosaic theory in an investment decision uh, versus an insider trading infraction can often boil down to being able to track this intent. And this e-coms e is absolutely crucial to being able to do this. I'm sorry, e-coms surveillance is absolutely crucial. Um, and this, you know, this covers obviously not only email, but all types of chat channels. And now, of course, in the last few years, we also have the um, the mobile chat applications, which are being used by by many portfolio managers and analysts. So there's, and not to mention voice communications, even video conferencing, et cetera. So there's just a multitude of channels, and ecom e surveillance has to really go, you know, far beyond the the original model of just email surveillance. Um, not not only to prevent insider trading violations, but of course also to be able to to defend, um, so a firm can defend itself against an insider trading inquiry. Um, so what's disturbing, however, about the state of current e-com surveillance is that it's actually very rudimentary in many firms, even very, even very large firms who have an otherwise very strong compliance culture. What we've found through actually multiple surveys that we've conducted in 2017 is that uh, many, many of these buy-side firms are actually still using rudimentary keyword detection models um, with, with manual supervision or manual oversight, which is you know, far from ideal um, when, when dealing with you know, the complexity of some trades and, and the sheer number of trades as well. So this, this, uh, this chart here shows the differences in types of firms and the types of e-coms e monitoring models they use. And what we're seeing is throughout the firms, the, um, a disturbing number of them actually still have no systematic e-coms monitoring at all. In, in our, <laughs> in of course the opinion of, of, of compliance, um, even one firm without, without systematic e-coms monitoring is a problem, and we're seeing a, a good you know, quarter or more of, of these um, within, uh, from, from especially the buy side firms, which would be the firms that absolutely need to use it the most. Additionally, we're also seeing the, the continuing prevalence of standalone e-coms e -coms models, which is certainly better than nothing, um, but still not ideal as to be truly effective and to really leverage and leverage the technology available, the surveillance technology available. The 
ECOM surveillance models should be integrated with the over, overall trade surveillance system. And many firms are just very uh, disturbingly behind in this type of implementation. So holistic integration can really be a key prevention tool in terms in, in ECOM's monitoring. And unfortunately, this is still un underdeveloped um, across the industry and also very prevalently underdeveloped in buy-side firms. The good news is that there, there is an answer. There are available solutions, and it's relatively easy to implement an integrated e-com surveillance model. Um, it's just it comes down to whether or not firms are uh, understand the available technology out there and and are able to access it, and uh, also have you know the the will and the budget to implement it within their firm. But it's the holistic integration. Um, can not only create much more effective alerts, but can also seriously help reduce false positives as well. Yeah, thanks, Danielle. I, I think the, you know, that's certainly consistent what we've um, what we're observing, and yeah, you know, I guess we're pointing there on the slide to I guess the benefits that come from breaking down, and this is equally on the sell side, you know. As, as the buy side, that you know the compliance functions are pretty much siloed. There's not much you know communication across and between them, um, and certainly there is a, a regulatory risk that you know if you're sitting on all this data and, and, and not making use of it, that you know there is certainly some risk there from you know a regulator's perception of, of how effective your, your monitoring and surveillance is. Um, or is, is your observations of within the buy side, you know, does that bear out what is there in the survey? Very much so, very much so. I think um, we, if we look at the, the typical solutions in place over the last, say, five years, most of the, the early boxes are ticked. Um, you know, we see um, good coverage instruments. We see a good understanding of the, the market mechanics and the idea of using um, for city models and assess material impact and those sort of techniques and what we're seeing now is people saying well how can we deal with intent how can we capture all these other information uh, streams and how can we manage the workload that they introduce so I think um, we, we um, touched on a moment ago about how manual some of this process can be so there's a, there's a very practical side of the holistic that's simply reducing the amount of manual labor required before you can start an investigation uh, it's, and it's a, it's a simple thing, but when we've we've talked to um, clients and we've done our own questionnaires, we found some like 80% of the time was actually spent on gathering data from different systems and different um, data sources before that investigation can start. So there's a practical side of this thing. There's simply let's put the right level of information, present it in the right in the context of of the investments, and um, and allow immediately the um, the, the compliance officer to focus their attention, their quality time, on those on those cases, and then we also look at using all these factors to what we talk about heat scoring alerts and the idea that it's quite easy to start adding on concepts of suspiciousness levels, and again, this allows a focus down effort on the few percent of cases which really warrant that attention. So, oh, this is only possible in a holistic system to bring these things together. So, I'd say that it's, it's incredibly important. And I think that's state of the art right now. Sure. Um, I think um, yeah, we're just about out of time, so I think we'll um, just, uh, I guess, as a recap, uh, we can see there the points that we've gone through. We've got a, a number of questions that have come through, so we so let's try and get to a, a, at least a couple of them. Um, are there a large number of false positive alerts generated by uh, NASDAQ or any, you know, well, NASDAQ's buy side compliance? Solution. How does your buy-side compliance solution reduce false positives? Well, that's a good question, and it's obviously goes right to the heart of how compliance officers spend their time. Um, we've seen pr previous generations of, um, of software solutions that have taken a more tick-box approach, and that they, they can potentially generate thousands of alerts with no real guide to the quality, and it's effectively now the compliance officer's time, or they have to end up hiring teams of people 
to to deal with these these clicking through these alerts because once they've taken on they've their responsibility of dealing with them, the account just can be dismissed them. So I think the concept of false positives we're very very sensitive to, and a lot of our drive to holistic and bringing in more factors and increasing the richness of our alerting is really aimed at driving the the quality of alerts and reducing that amount of false positives. Uh, I think we we do a great job, and I think there's still lots we can do, and we're, we're working on some quite new interesting research in that area. Uh, um, our testing and evidence suggests that you know, something like the workload, just by our heat scoring and other methods, reduces the, down to like a few percent of what would typically be, need to be done with a tick box approach. So um, yes, um, I think we're doing great there. So the, I think we touched on this one around events, but um, yeah, what the t types of events that you need, if you want to cover insider trading, um, what sort of events do you need to capture? But you know, how complex is it to get those um, data points? What's, what's your experience there? Yeah, we're, we're, we're very sensitive that this could be a barrier to adoption. And uh, often we've, we've met with clients officers and they say, oh, we love this, we'd love to do this, only we cannot get it the data. We, 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 we struggle to with our systems. They're in a bad state. and um, so. We, we've got a lot of experience with this, and we try to make this as simple as possible. Um, it can be a, a, a simple case of dropping some CSV files um, into a dedicated host, which will then process data. It, it doesn't have to be a high, high um, cost, massive integration exercise. It, we can lower the barriers a lot and keep it very simple, and that will get you. That with just a few files will get you a long way there, and then we can help cl clients understand. With the, what they consider their primary risk, what files are required, what data required, and guide them with what's worked best with other clients. And we can you know, we can talk about what's best practice, and again try to make it easy for them to to over time bring in more data sources. And I think what we've seen in terms, of, and it links back to what you said about the positive changes of compliance within the within companies, that now compliance officers have got more influence and they can actually say to the rest of the business, you know what, we can do this form of, form of surveillance, but you will need to change your systems, you will need to change your procedures, so we will have the data to do this. And we've definitely seen that over recent years. Some of our larger clients have made some big changes. It's been driven by the quality of the compliance. Sure, sure. Um, is it possible to get a copy of the deck? Um, yes. Um, so we'll make sure that that gets sent out. Uh, can NASDAQ surveillance tool link the alerts with the relevant news release? Yes. Yes, that's what one of the things we do. We bring in various news sources and put them in a the context of the, of, the, of the alert. Okay. If an asset management firm does not execute orders in markets, only uh, has an intermediation desk and does not accept orders from clients, does a firm have the obligation to monitor and detect and, when applicable, communicate suspicious orders to the competent authority? That's a good question. Um, I, now this would be my interpretation, and, and I think that, that I'm, I'm not a legal expert, but the way I look at it in terms of fiduciary responsibility is I can't just ha hand off that responsibility. If, if I'm going to ask someone else to execute my orders on my behalf, I need to do, understand who they are and their processes and do my own due diligence on them. So I would say that it's, there, is, there is some responsibility there. And I think, and I've, again, some experience of this now seeing the, the sell side becoming more aware that they have to be able to, with their buy side clients, explain to them the surveillance they do and be more transparent there for these reasons. And it, it goes right back to what I said at the start in terms of the, the large mandates, the pension funds being so ethically aware, they're demanding transparency all the way down the process. And that is a chain that's passed down. So they may, the, the regulations may be slightly lagging, but the actual requirements of some of these large pension funds and, and we talk about investor advisors are very high standards in terms of due diligence. And they will, they will spend time and looking, interviewing you before they allocate capital and understanding your, your processes around these areas. And that's why I say you should be doing that. Great. Um, and okay. additionally, I'm sorry, actually, additionally, it can be argued that it can be part of the fiduciary duty to the buy side clients as well to, in, to ensure that the order management system is above board. Um, many buy sides find that using the monitoring and surveillance systems can help them prevent um, sell side infractions such as front running, for, for instance. Yeah, absolutely. Thanks, Danielle. 
Um, I think we're, we are running out of time. Um, so th there were a few more questions. We'll come back um, to those via, via email. Um, so thank you everyone for joining. Uh, we encourage you to visit the Cybernetics webpage for more information um, around the NASDAQ by side compliance solution um, and to download our latest white paper on insider trading. Uh, with that, I'd like to thank you for attending today's presentation. Uh, like, as I said, if we do not get to your question during the se session, we will respond offline. We will be sending out a notice as soon as today's webinar recording is available. Uh, thank you again, and you may now disconnect.